It's next my pleasure to welcome Keith Narr, the Chief Technology Officer at Cargill. So this has been a really special week for us. You maybe heard us say a little bit about it's been Ag Tech Week, the first time we've done that. And we were really blessed that we got the opportunity to welcome Cargill into town this week, and they opened the Cargill Innovation Lab. Now, they've been working on that for nearly two years, but to have that culminate in this week was really an important milestone for us, and really great to see the new space and celebrate it. Anybody who's here from the Cargill team, if you can just stand, I just wanted to recognize Cargill for um, opening here today, this, this week, and letting us be a part of your celebration. So thank you, all of you. So Keith is uh, the leader of Cargill's Digital Labs, and that's the area that we were excited to be able to be part of our research park along with R&D. This is a group within Cargill that is working on data transformation, and it's leading global IT, and it's important because it's going to change the way they think about agriculture as well. So we're really excited to have Keith tell you more about Cargill, more about how they're using digital technologies, and I'll say how he took 21 years, I think, at Target Corporation beforehand and thought about how do you apply all those modern skills, data analytics, data sciences, into the future of enterprise that will impact agriculture and take us into the future and feeding the world. Thank you so much, Keith, for joining us. Please welcome Keith Narr. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for uh, welcoming Cargill uh, to the Ag Tech Summit and to, to Ag Tech Week, uh, especially Chancellor uh, and Laura. It's been a great week. So as Laura mentioned, we opened our Innovation Center. Um, and we've felt nothing but welcome since we got, we got on campus. So we appreciate that and look forward to, to a continued uh, great relationship over the next few years. Uh, for those of you that have worked with Cargill in the past, Hopefully you saw some things on the video that don't quite look like what you've typically interacted with Cargill in. And for those of you that haven't been exposed to Cargill, uh, welcome to the new Cargill. So for those of you that don't know Cargill, uh, we're a 155-year-old global company, which I think makes the University of Illinois look a little like a startup at 152 years. Um, but we operate, we operate around the world. We have about 160,000 employees, uh, and our purpose uh, has been to nourish the world in a safe, uh, safe, responsible, and sustainable way. And that hasn't changed. Uh, but what has changed is we now have a set of digital tools and data that we can use to bring Cargill into the next 155 years. So what excites me is when I think about Cargill and think about being able to be part of the world's food supply chain for the last 155 years, that requires continued innovation, continued reinvention, continued exploration of how do we enter new markets, how do we maximize what we're doing, how do we make, how do we make the farmers uh, as successful as they can be, whether that's from a financial perspective or from a, from a satisfaction with what they're doing. Those things haven't changed. Um, we're still truly rooted in that, in that purpose of nourishing the world, whether it's farmer livelihood. So the, the video showed uh, an example of shrimp farming. Often when we interact with farmers, what we, hear, what we will hear is, all we want is more time to spend with our family. We don't need more technology that doesn't work. We don't need another application um, that sidetracks us from doing our business. <laughs> So what we're trying to do in that example is create a platform that allows farmers to, to run, their, run their operation in a, in a safe, responsible way and, and optimize the output of the investment they're making. That also helps us with some of the other things that are important to us. So when we think about um, water resources, if we can optimize the amount of feed that the shrimp farmers are feeding, that increases water clarity and water safety, another output of lowering investments for the farmers. So as we look at some of these digital ventures that we're taking on, we're thinking about um, not just how does it help Cargill, but how does it help the farmers? Sustainability is another important thing, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I do want to make the point that when we think about Cargill and how we're applying digital tools and digital technology, it really does anchor back to our mission, um, and that's super important for us. 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, a few examples that we're working on uh, when it comes to, to digital transformation and digital kind of reinvention of ourselves. Um, so I have a lot of members of the data science team uh, with me here today. And one of the things that we've been exploring is how do we use artificial intelligence um, and things like video recognition, uh, sorry, uh, video, visual analytics, video analytics, uh, and audio analytics to help our farmers. An example, a couple examples of that are uh, when it comes to chickens. Um, how do we use the sound a chicken makes if you didn't know there are about 23 vocalizations chickens make and we can listen to what the chickens are saying and take action based on that. So if you think back to 2015, in 2015 there was a, an outbreak of the avian flu uh, that impacted about 42, 42 million chickens and 7 million turkeys across 21 states in the United States, which had a huge impact on, on the market. As we know, when we get sick, we start, talk, we start sounding differently, our voice, voices get scratchy, uh, we start talking slower and things like that. Chickens do the same thing from what we found out. And if we can listen to what the chickens are saying in the, in the barn, we can take action, which hopefully could prevent an outbreak like the avian flu that we had in 2015. So these are the types of things that we're looking at. How do we apply technology in different ways and use data in different ways uh, to help our farmers and help our markets? Another example, uh, within this space, a similar example is in the, in the turkey business. Um, so we're working um, also in the turkey business with some video analytics and watching how turkeys move around barns. Um, once again, when they get sick, they start moving in different patterns and, and taking different um, steps uh, and wobbling differently. And we can identify patterns and changes in those patterns and hopefully identify uh, as our turkey flocks uh, may start to uh, get sick and get disease, and we can take action based on that. So just a couple examples of how we're using and trying to use data uh, and technology in different ways uh, within, the, within the poultry business. Another area um, that is quite important and an investment that we're making uh, is around satellite imagery and how we use satellite imagery uh, to, help, to help identify things like climate change, um, sustainability practices, and things, and things like that. So we've, we've partnered with a, a company called Descartes Labs uh, out of New Mexico that really is a, uh, a we think, a forerunner in the, in the satellite imagery uh, space. And we're using their technology and their platforms to help us identify um, crop cover patterns, uh, and things like that so we can measure sustainability uh, practices as well as look at uh, forca forecasting crop yield uh, globally. Uh, and this, this has given us some, some extreme power when we look at the global food supply chain and trying to forecast the supply chain of how that food is going to move around the world. Uh, so this is, a, is, a, is an investment that we've made. And an example, um, and I'll go back to to Chancellor said it, and I, and I think he hit, hit it spot on, like one of the things that's super important for us uh, for this week is to make connections. Um, most of the things that were in the video and the things that I'm talking about, we have people from the team that are here uh, that can represent these, and it's super important for us to make connections, whether it's with this, within the, the startup community, partners, um, or competitors, because the problems that we're trying to solve we're not going to be able to solve by ourselves. And we all know the, the forecast is 2 billion more people in the world in the next 20 years. Um, and it's not just about the number of people, but it's also about the changing uh, dietary habits um, and protein that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to provide uh, to make sure that the world can continue to thrive. So when we think about the partnerships and the connections that we make, um, one of the things that we're super passionate about is um, open technology, uh, open platforms, and open data standards. So if I think historically, as we have run independent businesses, we've worried about and focused on the data within our organization and how do we optimize that. 
And I think as we look forward, um, really what we're trying to promote uh, within Cargill is how do we provide open platforms and open data standards to exchange data, um, whether it's between competitors, customers, um, or NGOs and things like that. Because as we look at really optimizing um, the global food supply chain, we're gonna have to operate um, more holistically as, a, as an end-to-end -end supply chain that's not just Cargill and it's not just another company. Um, so, that, so those are some of the things that we're talking about um, internally and, and pushing. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. Um, but it leads, it leads to um, some of the key partnerships. So one of the things, um, I think ADM is here, um, which, is, which is awesome. Um, a typical competitor of Cargill. Um, but an example of, we have entered into a joint venture with ADM who have, we have traditionally been competitors, and now we're coming together to provide solutions to farmers that allow farmers to, to have more informed decisions as it comes to marketing their grain. So historically, we probably would have looked at that as two independent companies going as competitive solutions to, to the farmers. And now back to what Sam was saying, if we, if we look at how do we make sure that we are providing financially viable solutions and helping the farmers uh, financially. This is an example where we came together with partners, uh, with traditional competitors, and are really looking at providing technology that enables the farmers to make the best decisions with the data from both companies that would have traditionally been independent. Another example of, of partnerships and really where we're looking to drive more cross-industry and cross-supply chain solutions uh, is in the technology space around blockchain. Um, and we, we think blockchain is a, a fundamental uh, game changer when it comes to the supply chain, whether it's a supply chain of food, financial services, commodities, um, and we are investing heavily in, I'll say blockchain-like technologies, so some open source technology um, within the Hyperledger space, uh, Splinter uh, and Hyperledger Grid, which really are, the intent is to be open platforms that we can all leverage to exchange data about the food supply chain. And really the intent of that is we believe if we all have access to the same technology, high quality technology and high quality thinking, really that is not a differentiating factor for the industry. What we do with that technology is where we can really differentiate each of our businesses. And instead of getting locked into proprietary solutions, if we provide those platforms and build those platforms as an agriculture industry, we can build those platforms for us as an industry that enable us to do what we want. So we're really, we're really bullish on uh, things like open source, open source software, uh, especially contributing quite heavily today to Hyperledger um, blockchain projects uh, in the context of Sawtooth. So I bring that up because I would invite, invite you all to um, reach out and let's have a conversation about how we can partner um, in things like that, whether that's through the university or, or through other relationships would be, would be fantastic. Um, the, last, the last thing to, to close, and then I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I just want to reiterate, like, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor for Cargill to be, to be part of this. Um, we have some huge problems in the food supply chain that we, need to, that we need to fix. I'm confident we can fix them. And I know that the tools that we have today when it comes to modern technology, data, and using it differently, and really working together to solve some of these problems, uh, we can work through this together as an industry. So thanks for the time, um, and I think we have five, five minutes or, or so for questions. Plenty. Plenty of time for questions if anybody has questions. <laughs> cool, thank you. I don't know if this is on, but I'm really loud, too. Did, did you want questions? 
So when you're talking about all of this new data, so um, are you, I'm sure that you're having conversations about the safety of this data. And so are there also, is there technology within data management and safety of all of these data? Yeah, great question. I'm glad you asked that. I forgot to, I forgot to talk about that. So um, one, of the, one of the things, uh, one of the core principles at, at uh, Cargill is, is safety, whether that's physical safety, um, emotional safety, or the, or the safety of our data. And, and that's something that we take really seriously. Um, as we think about some of the investments, so I'll answer it in two ways. One, one internal Cargill data. Um, we're really focused on security, privacy, and compliance. Um, so we know that um, the laws around privacy and, and compliance are non-negotiable. Um, and we need to, need to continue, continue to up our game when it comes to data management, because I believe um, not just meeting the the legal requirements is enough. I think we need, we need to go above that. Um, when it comes to how do we share information more broadly across the ecosystem, um, I think that's, that's one thing that, that uh, is super important to us. And, and when I talk about blockchain, the, the initial investments that we made within that space were, were all, re all related to security and securely transmitting data to meet the needs of, of a large enterprise. So if we think of kind of the history of, of where that technology grew out of, it was kind of the, the Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency space, which had a bunch of different requirements than what we would have um, as large enterprises. So there's a couple, couple of things that we're thinking about. Um, I mentioned Splinter, um, which is, which is a, an open source project, which really allows us to share data among a uh, distributed group of, of companies and provide secure transactions in between independent companies on that, on that network. Um, so I think as we look at maturing what we're doing in that space, data privacy is a must, um, as well as, as um, security and confidential, confidentiality when it comes to whether it's customer data or farmer data and things like that. So, so significant investments we're making within that space because that's a, I think, I think in the industry now, like that's a table stakes. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, in regards to how you intend to implement Splinter into uh, maybe a core group of businesses for a data sharing process, um, how do you intend to mesh that process with the traditional mindset of data security and, and the farming process overall from an end user standpoint here? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I wish I had a spot on answer to that. Um, part of that answer is we're figuring it out. Um, so I think one of the things as we look internal at Cargill, um, we're trying to figure out how we change our culture to be more iterative on figuring out problems like that. We're, we're just entering this space um, and some of the technology that we're inventing, um, we don't have all the answers and we have to figure them out. Having said that, I think the, um, what we have found is the, the first three or four engagements we've had with a number of customers, that's the biggest challenge that we have to work through. And it, and it really doesn't have anything to do with um, technology. It's all business process uh, and legal and compliance requirements which are different for every company. Um, so we're, we, uh, one thing that we're, we're doing to, within that space specifically is starting to work with some of the, um, I'll say, industry consortiums. So like in the, in the retail space, we're, we're partnering with uh, GS1, which is the global standard for item information. Um, to really look at how do we enable that data and those standards consistently across the technology space so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but we will continue, we'll have to continue to figure out how to, how to enable uh, security and privacy in a way that meets the differing requirements of multiple companies. Love to talk more about that if you want. If the U.S. and the global grain market movements was forced to come to grips with the concept of tracking commodities 
point of origin, things such as this, is Cargill and others, are Cargill and others working on technologies that would be provide a cost-effective way of tracking if we were forced to do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. It's one that we have wrestled with, and, and I would say in some spaces, um, we are working on solutions um, where we can track, I'll say, things globally through the supply chain. You, you brought up grain as an example. Um, you know, we've, we've started down that road a couple times. It, it becomes super complicated. The way that the, the process works today when grain all comes to a single place and gets mixed, mixed together. Um, so from a, from a technology perspective, like we really have to figure out how we would change the processing of those things to make sure that we didn't mix grains together so that we could actually track them. Obviously, we're not gonna, we're not gonna track grains at the individual grain level. That's not, that's not feasible. Um, but still, the processing around how do, we, how do we make sure that we separate the origin through processing is the, is the hard part. Um, we, have, we have the same challenge, I would say, within um, a beef processing facility, as an example. So through the disassembly process, um, we lose track of where different, different uh, cuts of beef would end up, and we're trying to figure out how we track those through. So we're experimenting um, with a couple of different methods, um, one of them being um, being able to s uh, spray that beef with a dye that we can then track through the, through the processing plant. Um, so we're, we're exploring a couple different things. Um, but if I think to, to straight answer to your question, if we were forced to have a solution now to be able to answer that question, I, I don't think we have a I don't think we have a robust solution without changing the processing uh, process that, that grains would go through. Definitely open to talking more if you have ideas. Good morning. Hi. Hi, my name is Bianca. I'm the founder of Agrio Water Distribution and Technology. Our mission is to address agricultural non-point source pollution head-on with a scientific and social humanitarian approach by inventing IP products for agricultural pollution and promoting other technologies that aid in saving the world's fresh water sources from suffering. Agrewa Water has two tr water treatment prototypes for phosphorus removal, including an electrocoagulation unit and a proof of concept formula for a highly sorptive phosphorus coagulant. Today, I just wanted to ask you if Cargill is doing anything in um, water sustainability as it relates to unregulated phosphorus pollution, or agricultural <laughs> pollution, excuse me. I'm looking at the team over there for an answer. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to get back to you on that question. Do you have a business card? Maybe we can talk offline. I will follow up with you, yes. Thank you, have a nice yes. rest of your day. All right, one more? We have one more, Keith, that was submitted online. Oh, okay. Oh, so maybe two more. Two more. Um, so this is from Joanna Calusi with the University of Illinois. And in regard to data use and artificial intelligence, what are the main barriers uh, that you see with Cargill? Yeah, um, so I'd love to hear the data science group answer to this question, but um, I will say from, from my perspective, probably the, the main barriers that we have today, um, if, I think about, and if I think about the history of Cargill, um, essentially over 155 years we have grown up through mergers, acquisitions, and joint ventures. And, uh, and as of uh, five, five to six years ago, we were essentially a holding company with 70 different companies within that. So there was, not, there was never an intent um, up until five years ago to be able to bring data together to look holistically at Cargill. So I, th I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we have today when it comes to artificial intelligence with our, with our core environment um, is really data quality uh, and, and data consistent data definition and data understanding to be, be able to bring that data together. When I think about um, implementing new things like listening to chickens or watching them, I think we have an opportunity to introduce 
net new clean technology that we can understand the data from the start. And I think we have a better advantage uh, in that space. But I think, I think our historic view of data, data management uh, is a barrier today, whether it's artificial intelligence or, or advanced analytics of, of any form. Hi. Uh, Alex Sheline, Emeritus from uh, UIUC Chemistry and President of SpectroClick, which is one of the startups uh, here in oh, Champaign. Cool. Uh, the immediately uh, preceding question <laughs> highlighted what I see as a uh, choke point where you're looking for interesting technologies, but finding them from these thousands of startups across the country is inefficient. Meanwhile, the startups are desperately looking for people to partner with, and uh, you'd say you have 160,000 employees we have no way to figure out which of those 160,000 is the right uh, place to go in. Is there work going on efficiently in either artificial or real intelligence to make it easier for you to find us and us to find you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and like maybe I can put a plug in to follow up with the, with the team after one of the things that, one of the projects that we're actually working on um, with the research park is a, um, a solution to do exactly that. Um, so, so we understand that complexity, um, and essentially what we're working on is a solution that will, um, I'll say, programmatically identify needs of um, biz large businesses or businesses of any size with solutions of a startup and match those together through algorithms. So please follow up. We're working on that. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks for the time. Once again, thanks for the, the warm welcome. <laughs>